Hello, my dotlings, and welcome to another shameless self-promotion right here in Madame Tortuga's Lounge with Dotty the Psychic as your host. Don't forget that you can also check out more of the story on Patreon, where the patrons go to support me, Dotty. You can also check out my website, D-O-T-T-I-E, thepsychic.com. With that being said, let's meet this shameless self-promotions guest. Hello, my dotlings. We are back with another shameless self-promotion, and this one is with Michelle Horan of Hearth Obscura Charm Works. So happy to be here. <laughs> what everybody notice I pointed the right direction. That never happens. Oh, because it, it's backwards? Yeah, it's right. Okay, so so if I point to you, then okay. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> what do you think about that, Dottie? <laughs> I don't know. See it again. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, so um, you had your horns. So earlier I got out my horns. This this was from my witch's ball outfit where I decided to be a pottery gangster. So I'm, it's my devil gangster hat with my <laughs> horns. <laughs> oh, there we go. Right? I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. I just got happy because they got Halloween stuff out already and it's like august 1st yeah it's yeah. august 1st and the halloween section's already been raided i gotta tell you why i i don't like christmas though i don't like i'm not a fan well really you not. know i'm really not thing. yule is okay yeah. i like solstice you know yule oh i love solstice yes we're pagans that's Christian, you know, Christmas is not our holiday. It's the other guy's <laughs> holiday. So I would like to play Krampus one day, though. That does sound cool. <laughs> Just going to go beat small children. No, we don't. I have to edit that oh, no, out. we're not supposed to, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, let's get on subject. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so, so, Michelle, and it. In the Patreon section, we're going to talk about all the nicknames because yes, I have Michelle, a lot of nicknames. Yeah, it, it's almost foreign to me. But Michelle is a local potter and teacher, and let's. I'm actually drinking from one of her mugs now. I feel I a whole monster in it. Yeah. See this one, yeah, because this one I fit a whole monster in there. Like, I'll that. tell you what, as a potter. When you get that mug that fits that eight or 16 ounces perfectly, you just feel like, oh, yeah, I'm so good. <laughs> it really does. But actually, like, because it's not the only piece. Of it. <laughs> this is actually one that's for sale. Like, when I get done uh -huh. with this live stream, I'm going to rinse this one off and put it back on the shelf for people to hopefully buy. Because it's yes. got, like, a match set and everything. I actually have quite a few of your pieces. But mm -hmm. I think my favorite is still the one that I was like, okay, this one is mine. I'm going to keep it. Yes. I loved making that piece. I really did. Um, it is a little difficult to throw that skinny and that tall, but then to carve it and it not break at any point is very, very tedious and takes a long time to do. But I loved how that piece turned out. I'm glad you have it. Yeah, I mean, and it does. It's in my business colors. Like, you can't really fully see all the green detail on camera because uh -huh. the camera never really picks up on every single detail. I'll tell you the truth. And this is also especially true because I pit fire my pottery. So there's a lot of black highlights, if you would, in my pottery. And so to photograph it, it takes a while to actually get it to where you can see it. And then when I ship something, people are always like, whoa, this looks so much better than I thought. And I'm like, well, that's great. But I wish the picture really showed it, though. You know, <laughs> you know what? You're you're a, you're a potter, not a photographer. That's I'm not. Doing. I'm not. I never took one photography class in college, actually, which in hindsight, I probably should have. <laughs> but I didn't realize like that. Well, you wear all the hats. All you do is a small business yeah. owner. Like I've got a girl preach. I mean, I thought, well, I'll just 
you know, make a lot of money in art and pay somebody to photograph my stuff. And it hasn't quite worked out that way. <laughs> I do it for love, mostly. <laughs> I tell you what, like, because you, you do it all. Like, I know that because um, you're doing classes, too. And I know that you're like the drumming lady for the area like she will be actually at metro valley pagan pride september yes. 16th she is doing yes. i know you're doing a public drumming circle let's talk a little bit i want to talk more about the pottery but i'm like i'm gonna we're gonna no, that's a, that's okay but we're actually gonna add our way through this as we do yeah we we, we will we will do our best <laughs> um okay so i don't actually know how many years it was i want to say maybe 17 year, maybe more. I don't know. Um, the, I got involved with the uh, Huntington uh, Unitarian Drum Circle. And I'm one of the three original people who started that group that are still doing it. Now, we've had a lot of people move away. Of course, they, you know, a lot of people were at Marshall. They graduated. They went to go do their dream job and whatever. So they went out of state. So we would have influx of folks and, you know, some people would like go, but I would say in all over the, that amount of years, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how many, probably a few hundred people have been to that drum circle. Uh, now that drum circle is not actually active right now, but um, with so my COVID. <laughs> seriously. So, uh, but with the, three original people and then my uh, my cohort in drum circle leadership classes and also will be joining us at Metro Valley Pagan Pride for the drum circle is my dear friend Jessica Jones. Um, now last, uh, let's see, was it like, yeah, end of last year, earlier this year? I can't quite remember at what time it was, but uh, we did, started doing drum circle leadership classes um, which so far we've held that at Crystal Lotus shop. Um, and we've been asked to, we, yeah, yeah, you were at that one. Yeah. And we've been asked to uh, teach that at, um, at Barefoot Gypsies and also been asked to teach it at festivals and things like this. So we're really trying to spread the love because we did, we had quite a bit of people leaving and just moving other places really. And so it's just been like, my house with the drum love. <laughs> now we did some um, some drum circles at the Old Lady on Sixth Avenue, which is a small art shop I work at in town. Uh, well, you gotta in with them so I can do a psychic shopping video there. Oh yeah, yeah. What if anybody wants me to do a psychic shopping video at your shop? It is very weird for me to approach shop owners and be like, I would like to film your shop because a lot of people who, especially people who have artisans in. Uh, other people come and film their shit and try to copy it. So, if you want to see a psychic shopping video done at your favorite shop, tell them about me. Okay, I will mention that because that house, and I can't remember exactly how old it is, but it's more than 100 years old. I know it's more than 102 years old, that house is. And it's a beautiful house, and the downstairs is a shop. Uh, with local artists and then Ted Taylor's art. And then I go there and work on from time to time when he needs me. Um, and then upstairs is where everybody lives. So uh, kind of neat, which I kind of have sort of like, not, I mean, not that big. I don't have a big shingle. Okay. I used to have a shop in central city years ago, but you know, I'm just one person again. And so that was before the internet and it was before, you know, it was forever ago. And yeah, all the pagans knew each other or they were off in the mountains. It was very difficult um, being able to like, you have to be there all the time. Oh yeah. So, so, you know, to go do a booth or do a festival or do a show or whatever thing, that was just too difficult to handle with a shingle out. So mostly um, I put my work in your shop, right? Uh, I have work at Crystal Lotus shop, at Barefoot Gypsy shop currently. And um, at the Old Lady on Sixth Avenue, I have some work. I do booths and local things around. Um, I was in the visitor center, which I'm going to get back in because actually what happened was uh, they closed the shop during 2020. 
And so I had to, all of the artists had to come pull all their wares. I just never went back, but I'd like to be in the visitor center again. So I'm making moves to make that happen. Cause I'd like to have kind of a local footprint. I enjoyed selling from the visitor center because, you know, I have a piece in Madagascar apparently now. <laughs> That's awesome. And I've had people, you know what though, your stuff is like world renowned, like really. Yeah, I've, I've had pieces go to Germany, to England, to Ireland, a few different places. So that's Australia, actually. I can't believe it made that, made it there in one piece. I must have did a go okay job packing. <laughs> but you know, it's fun when you have shops because <clears throat> I'm kind of like, I guess you'd say, an independent contractor. And but if Crystal Lotus Shop needs crystal ball stands, then I'll make you a bunch of crystal ball stands, you know, or somebody needs incense holders. I'll make the incense holders. So, you know, you, you know, certainly you can buy wonderful goods and products and services, you know, from people you don't know. But please, like a potter made this. I mean, if you can, don't buy the mug from the chain store. <laughs> yeah, buy, the, buy your special mug from somebody who made it to be special. This piece right here is one of my favorite pieces, and I feel like it has never gotten the love that it deserves because I don't see a whole lot of these. This was this is an incense holder, but it's also like hollowed out so that you can put a, a square piece, and it's got the catch on it. But it is perfect for your little mini crystal balls. Yes, yes. So um, now some of my pieces uh, will have odd edges. I'm a very organic potter. Um, I rarely do anything smooth. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, I have to make myself make something smooth. Um, and uh, I throw on the wheel and hand build both. But uh, if, you know, when you do a good job on your pottery, and it's not meant to be a, uh, uh, you know, an organic piece, but more as a, uh, uh, you know, you could use this for a jar. I've made urns for people's animals. I made cremains pendants with fused glass, um, which is something I feel is very important. But a piece like this, you know, you could use it as a jar, but also, right. And I'm not gonna, cause it's too heavy. This ball is heavy, <laughs> so, but. But I mean, it's, it's like a perfect deal, though. Like, if you want to put your herbs in there, like your, your yes. like herbs, that would be super I cool. Have, see, I have things down in here, actually. This is mine. And this is so funny because you wouldn't believe it. But this, when this pot came out of the oxidation fire, it was the ugliest thing I had ever seen in my life. I was going to go crack it. And somebody said, well, why don't you pit fire it? And I said, well... You know, I mean, might as well. I'm not going to hurt it, right? Now it's like my favorite piece. I won't sell it. <laughs> so it's, I, I love, and again, with the camera, right? You can't really, you know, but it turned out really beautiful. But that is the difference in using the pit fire method as opposed to oxidation, which I can talk about a little bit here. Yeah, uh, that's a little bit of difference because I know that, um, you know what? You tell us more about the difference between pit fire and oxidation, because I know you also have done porcelain and then you do yes. earthenware. And I don't understand a lot of the differences. So you tell the people about that while I go pick up some more of my favorite pieces off sure. of the okay. uh, gift shop section. Of okay. um, so what is what is earthenware versus porcelain? Let's start there. Okay, so there are different kinds of clays um, that are clay bodies. And so they have clay, uh, you know, clay just like from the creek or whatever, but they also uh, have other things in them such as frit, which is ground up, uh, ground up pottery that gives it strength. Um, earthenware, it basically comes fresh out of the ground practically. I mean, you filter the bugs out of it mostly. Um, there's a beautiful earthenware, white earthenware slick in Grace in Kentucky that I like to go dig sometimes. Uh, and then there's also red earthenware bodies, which is what I'm working in right now. Earthenware is the lowest firing clay. That means it doesn't take very much to make it, uh, to make it ceramic. So at about uh, 1889 degrees, uh, it turns into ceramic. So ceramic is the actual fired piece and it tinkles when you click it. 
Um, porcelain is one of the highest firing clays. Um, it's very, very smooth, just like earthenware, but it has things in it. Like my, my personal per porcelain has a lot of talc in it. Well, they've actually discontinued some of the clay bodies that are my favorite to work in. But I started working in talc clays um, when I was 19 and was in college. Uh, and so, um, I, you know, if, if I'm going to get white lung, I probably would have got it by now. <laughs> So, uh, but, uh, but talc bodies are extremely smooth and pliable. So here is a piece of um, earthenware that is not fired yet. And this piece, if you can see how literally smooth that piece is, which makes it an excellent clay for carving. Um, I like to use the earthenware or the porcelain because I like to carve. Now, if you use stoneware or a clay such as that, that's a medium range clay that has a, yeah, <laughs> that one, <laughs> the, uh, the stoneware has uh, more grit in it, more of that broken up pottery shards uh, that give it more strength. I don't particularly like to use uh, stoneware because when you throw it on the wheel, it's extremely heavy to pull and I have some bone issues so that it's a very difficult for me to work with it and also when i take my tool and i carve into this clay um i'm making extremely smooth mark there is no uh you know there's but if you have the little bits of pottery in there like the stoneware you know you pull it and then here comes out a grain or a grain like that and so it kind of roughens up the texture um those pieces are wonderful for you know, utilitarian wear, um, but for where I like to kind of make things especially arty uh, and I like to carve so much, um, I just prefer to use these types of clays. All of those clays uh, and all of my pieces are food safe um, and they will hold water unless you have me make an unglazed piece, for example, like a planter. Uh, you know, you wouldn't want to glaze the inside of the planter because uh, it would, you know, it actually helps water your plant to have the inside of that unglazed. Um, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. It uh, cut off effect, didn't it? Did it, did you say it cut off? No, I said, is it like a terracotta, like, a, you know, you remember the terracotta of waters? That terracotta really is, yeah, terracotta is more similar to earthenware. Um, earthenware also has the benefit of you can actually cook in it. Like you could take an earthenware, a casserole dish and put it in your oven and cook your casserole in that dish because the earthenware is extremely ductile uh, and conducts heat very well and very evenly. So that's another one of the benefits of using earthenware clays. Um, but like I said, all my pieces are food safe. I tend to not recommend that people dishwash or put them in the microwave just because they're done with that extra uh, little flare of pit firing. And I feel like it kind of messes with the details a little bit. Yeah, that's a crystal ball holder. Yeah. Or, you know, I, I like that color. I made a lot of prosperity pieces with that with that chrome green. Uh-huh. See, isn't that pretty? I know that's a lot of like a lot of the... Uh... A lot of the pieces I have um, are in that green or that purple. Yes. Because they're my business colors. One of my favorite pieces I would love to show off is not here. I decided to keep it for myself. Um, but it has like almost like almost like you look looks like you painted a scene on it. Some of them I do. Some of them I do. Oh. I want to talk about because I know we got a lot of pagans here. That's kind of what this is all about. Yes. Talk about your little offering bowls. Yes, yes. So Crystal okay. bowl slash offering bowls. Before we started uh, the broadcast, uh, we were discussing a little bit about um, how magic is in my work. I'm not a potter who does folk magic. I'm a witch who does pottery. Um, your, you know, anything that you're doing with this clay, it's using water in the clay body. It uses earth, of course, the different elements, you know, that you would use on the glazes. Um, and you, you know, you, you fire it. So you use fire. Yes. I like that one, you. 
Um, um, there's not a single one that I don't like. But, you know, when you think about making pottery, unless you're doing certain kinds of pieces, you are making a vessel. When I make the vessel on the wheel and I'm thinking about what I want it to be, or if I'm hand building the vessel, you know, I'm thinking about while I have this on the wheel, I want this bowl to be a nice, solid, sturdy bowl as far as the craftsmanship of it. Um, I don't want any, you know, real flaws in it or anything. So I try very much to, you know, make sure my bottoms are right and my sides are even and such like this. But this is a vessel. This is a vessel. What is more important to uh, witchy ways than the vessel, the mother? Um, this could hold food. This could be a scrying bowl. Uh, again, the, you know, these things could be used to hold, you know, this would be a huge sphere, right? That you could hold, you could hold us, you know, use it for a sphere. You could use it for a smudge bowl. Uh, you could, you know, you, uh, I've got uh, one, uh, one of my first uh, cauldron type smudge bowls is up at Crystal Lotus Shop and they use it there for their workings. Um, but, you know, you are quite a collection of yours. Yeah. So, you, you know, you're talking about every element being involved in this process. Clay in its nature is cold to the touch. Uh, it's cool. And I always tell this to on the first class that people come here to a home studio and learn how to do clay. I, t I tell, you know, put your hand on that and feel it. How does it feel to you? It feels cool. The clay actually absorbs the energy from your body it absorbs heat energy of course as you're working with it it, it absorbs your physical momentum that you're using with it uh, you know everything about it is absolutely elemental and that's what i love about it even the glazes you know if i look at this glaze i can tell you i know i know what this glaze is called it's a production glaze um but when i look at this glaze i can tell that there's some iron oxide in that glaze that there's probably a wee bit of cobalt in that glaze and and such like that so you know you were talking about elements too this piece that i showed you earlier this is one of my favorite glazes and it's red iron red and i love red iron red because it just reminds me of the body and blood and vitality um at the bottom of that how it's like a different pattern yeah yeah um, and then you were asking about the difference between oxidation and reduction. So when you have a piece like this, this is a piece that I made. It has not been fired yet. If you tap it, it does not click. It does not ding. That's what a good pot does. It dings when it's ceramic. This is not because it's not fired yet. This is a measuring piece, by the way. Ooh. Yeah. So... I've had a lot of success. Well, I'm doing it the wrong way. <laughs> I've had a lot of success with the mushroom series. Um, so, uh, and I knocked a little piece off that. I'll have to fix that. <laughs> That's all right. It's not fired yet. I mean, it happens. So, <clears throat> apparently, um, there was one mushroom that was just not meant to be on there. Yeah, I guess that mushroom just didn't want to. That's okay. That's all right. It's pottery. It's just clay. I always tell people that when, you know, when they're down here working and they mess up on something, I'm like, though, this slot bucket is just clay. <laughs> it's not worth crying about, you know. Sometimes you, you do break a piece and it makes you sick because you worked on it so hard. <laughs> but oxidation is the uh, environment in the kiln. The kiln is a type of oven that fires at a very high temperature. It's not like, you know, you can't fire ceramic in your uh, range, right? right. Uh, special, special type of oven. They can be electric, they can be gas, they can be wood fire. Wood fire pottery is beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and in this environment where the temperature goes up, this clay is actually releasing uh, uh, oxygen into, into, into the environment. So an oxidation fire is a heavily oxidate oxidized environment in the kiln. Now with a piece like that, you, you know, and you glaze it and then you would get like something like this. It's very light. It's exactly the color of what the glaze is and such. When I pit fire, uh, I'm actually taking that uh, object and putting it into a live working fire. 
And uh, I'm really excited because I get to demonstrate that to people uh, coming up soon. I have a couple new clay students I picked up at Crystal Kingdom Festival. So that's wonderful. And so I'll be demonstrating that again soon as well. And it's really cool. You know, I'm down literally in the fire and, you know, it's a very energetic environment. And this fire, what I'm trying to attempt with the live fire is to get reduction. So if you had a fire in your fire pit at home and it had a very bright color to it, a nice big flame, it was really bright, kind of white and yellow sort of, that, that is because that that fire is getting plenty of oxygen. When I'm doing reduction, I'm actually, and I actually do this in a, in a really nice metal garbage can actually that I put holes and stuff in to vent. Uh, and I put all my fuel in there and it's really, it's just yard waste and such like this that I'm going to, you know, put in the fire anyway. So it's another way to use what I've grown to, you know, I, I can't think of the word, but to, to put, put, to put, you know, the things that I've grown into the, my piece, it's right? a level of intention to it. Yes, yes, it is a level of intention. Absolutely. And then so I smother the fire. So now the fire, it starts to roll. It starts to curl and roll and it turns dark red. Uh, it start, first turns like a real dark orange and it turns a real dark red. And then at that time, I'm trying to smother the fire out. So I slam the lid on and this piece goes and sucks in all the carbon from the fire. And I do different methods to get different results as far as crackling goes. There's just, I just did like the edge of that one. Uh, crackling or spotting or dripping. This uh, crystal ball stands has a lot of nice dripping on it. Um, and then I get in there and when it looks perfect, I pull that out and I throw it in a thing of ice cold water and it sings. It sings. When you throw it in the water, it goes sweet. And to me, that is like the last step. To me, that is like when you put that piece into the oxygen fire, it's giving something up. When you're putting it into the live fire and then putting dunking it into the water, it's sucking back in. So to me, that is the idea of bringing that piece to life. Changing my light here so people can really, because this one is, like I said, this is also one of my favorite pieces because you really did, like, now that you're talking about the individual processes, I can really see that in this. Because I know there are parts on this that are almost, like, smoothed out. And mm -hmm. I think where they've soaked up, like, they've had less of the actual, like, glaze on them. Mm -hmm. And so they've soaked up more of the carbon and it gives it a completely different, like... Yes, it's very unique and dynamic texture, and you can see that that cracking, especially up at the top here. Let's see, I think that's probably the most. And one thing I really like about the porcelain doing that, where you glaze it and then you rub it off and then pit fire it, is when I do skulls because skulls are like one of my favorite things. And uh, when I do skulls, I wipe off that extra glaze, so basically it's the naked clay. Well, when you put it in the fire, it looks just like bone. I mean, it's beautiful how it turns out when you put it in the pit fire. I wish I had one of those to show you right now, but I've sold them all. <laughs> That's good. We like it. Um, let's see. Here's a here's another idea of something. Um, this is a spiritual working that I have done for someone. I have a friend who has lives on her yes that one yeah. yeah i have a friend who lives on her family's property that they have had in the family for over 100 years and she has a root cellar and she wants to start well she's been doing she's my goodness she's been doing a lot she's raising all kinds of different kinds of fowl you know even a quail which i think is wonderful uh, I love quail <laughs> and uh, she's uh, doing a little bit of farming and stuff and really trying to bring that property back to life from her family. Right. That root cellar, um, she felt like there was an entity in there. And I guess there had been tales of it throughout history and whatever. And so what she wanted to do was to give that entity a home. And so I have made for her a spirit house for the entity.
Oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah, and we're going to put it, uh, or she's going to put it kind of at the edge of the wood so it's away from the cellar and then try to draw the spirit into the house and then take it out and put it next to the woods. But I want to show you this. So <clears throat> she, um, I, I made it to look similar to her root cellar because by making it similar to a root cellar, I was hoping to attract the spirit. Right. And, and then for the inside, I have made her an offering bowl where she can give the spirit offerings. The top, as you can see, has an incense stick because we want the little chimney going for the spirit in the house. And you can take the lid off so that she can get in there and clean it and such. Nice. Yeah. That was awesome. I can't wait for the birds to move in. <laughs> Actually, when I when I usually when somebody commissions me to do something, I usually make more than one of the things because actually just the rhythm of there's a rhythm to clay. Um, you have to catch things at certain stages of the clay to do certain things to the clay. Like if you're gonna carve it, it has to be at a certain stage. If it's past that stage, you, you know, you really can't carve it. Maybe you can use it, but you can't, you can't really carve it after a certain stage. Um, so there's different, you know, you know, a lot of, I'll, I did three of these because that's the timing that I had. I could put, make one, put it to the side, make one, put it to the side, put it to the side. Then by that time that I was ready to carve this one uh, because it was ready. So um, there's a definitely a rhythm uh, to clay uh, so much so that I've been doing this for 37 years. And so much so that I can pretty much tell people within five minutes what time it is <laughs> because I'm just used to living my life in such a rhythm of clay, you know. So it's there's there's hardly anything of me left. I'm just a I'm just a tool. <laughs> I'm just a tool. <laughs> you know what though? I understand that because with the whole psychic thing, uh, because I charge by the minute in a lot of ways, like I, I charge in 15 minute increments. I can tell you uh, about what time it is within a half an hour or yeah, so. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, and, I you, and I can definitely tell you, and it's funny because this is another one of those space things, because as a, as a fellow merchant, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly how to pack. You can look at something and look at the space <laughs> it's supposed to go into and tell, even if there are different spots in that field, you have still got a pretty good idea of whether that's going to fit or not. Uh, so, um, I, you know, Hearth Obscura Charmworks is my baby, but I have a real effort towards supporting local artists. Um, I have some people who booth with me who are just friends that make things. Um, Stormboard Divinations, uh, Valeria Poole, she makes a lot of beautiful resin spirit boards and such, and pendulum boards and such that you'll see, see at our booths. Uh, my friend Robin used to be my student. She made this goddess pendant. And let me bring this out so you can see it better. But uh, she was my student and now we're friends. <laughs> and she did her, her first booth with us at the hot dog festival last weekend. Um, I definitely, you know, I, I want to, I feel like we need to support each other. And I'm going to tell you what, it has never hurt me to have other people's wares in my booth. It makes our booth exciting. It makes it where it's not just all about me. It's fun. Yeah, you know, we we end up having people come to our booths just because of the riotous laughter that's going on. Because yeah, we're doing business, but we also want people to understand there's a real person making this work for you. And uh, we, you know, really booths are less of. A, I mean, we like to sell things, of course we do, but it's less of a salesy thing. Uh, yeah, that, gets rich being a being an event merchant. No, uh, no, that you are you are you are surviving. You're surviving. If if you're doing real good, you're you're you might have a little scratch to save back, but yeah. And uh, really, it goes like back into my materials. It goes back into materials. It goes back into tools. You know, it goes back into paying the electric for the kiln. You know, and set and the water for the clay. Uh, here's a piece that she made. It's a little goddess pendant. That's beautiful. And, uh, so, uh, and uh, let's see, at Crystal Kingdom Festival, uh, one of my friends, Samantha, who was a pottery student of mine, she has her own wheel now. 
and she has her own little studio set up. Robin has her own little studio set up. And, you know, I really like to support other artists and say, hey, you can do it. You know, you can do it. And I think that it connects our personalities with the work that we're doing so that people see it's a real person. But then also, uh, you know, it's really fun to just get to know the community. Uh, it's, it's so interesting the things people will tell you and that, you know, they'll be like, this piece is perfect and this is why, or I'm going to give this piece to so-and-so. They already know who they're going to give it to. Right. Um, I do and, know sometimes people will take something and have like a completely different idea. Oh, yeah. Created oh, yeah. it for. Yeah, that definitely happens. Um, and then I like to do custom work. Um I also make drums. I didn't put a drum here up on the table, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I make drums. Um, let's see. I've got, <laughs> this is one of my goofier little items. I started making eyeball pillows. <laughs> I want to get one of those. I want to get one of those. But I want to get it sitting size to put in front of my altar here at the office. Yeah. I got a altar at the office. And um, this is. This is Appalachian resourcefulness. I upcycled all of this fabric. So um, I have a friend that works at a furniture store and found out, uh, he's a manager of the furniture store <clears throat> and found out that they throw away. You know how when you go to pick out a couch and here's the all different colors you can get it in? Uh -huh. Those books of fabric, they throw those away. And I was like, no, you don't. I was like, bring them here. And so that's one of the things that I've done with uh, upcycling that fabric. As Appalachian artisans, we have to be resourceful. Oh, yeah. There is no waste. Um, if you're wasting, you're too rich. <laughs> you know, so anything and everything. Uh, anything and everything that can be used. And when people lots of times will donate art supplies to the cause, and if, if it's not something I'm doing right now, you know, if, if I'm not really into beating right now, but I know somebody who is, then I just give that to them, you know, and I mean, we just help each other in that way. And I think that's really positive. You know what, that, that would be really cool to do like a uh, resource swap for art projects. That's not a bad idea at all. You're looking um, at that for Metro Valley Pagan Pride. We'll, we're gonna find <sighs> that out later. That would be super yeah. cool. We're, we'll that's talk about this later. Okay. 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 I want to flesh it out before we make announcements like this, but sure. like, yeah, let's definitely, cause that would be great for, um, you know, Metro Valley Pagan Pride is not just one event. Like we're, we're starting some, we're starting like a movement of sorts. Yes. With it, you know, and I gotta say again, I, I said this at first when I came on, but I thank you very much. So anybody who's watching, um, Dottie said, Hey, I want people to know what you're all about. Like that rarely happens that I actually get a chance to sit and just dish about my work. And so I really appreciate this. And I really appreciate you taking up the reins on Metro Valley Pagan Pride. We definitely need to continue to be doing these events. Um, and I, you know, I understand, you know, there was a, a Colin, uh, Mr. Yeah. Colin. Yeah. Asked actually, and yeah. Take up the reins. And I appreciate you doing that. I tell you what, it was like, I think everybody was staring at this. It was kind of funny because it was definitely one of those moments where it felt like the whole community was now staring at this orphaned event. Yes. It, it was very yes. much, it was an orphaned event. I'm like, if somebody doesn't pick this up, it's going to die. Somebody okay. pick this up. I guess it's, sure. it's going to be me. I'll, I will pick this up. And then everybody else was like, hey, you picked it up. You're great. We're going to follow you. Anybody could have picked it up, but I was I was the one who who was stupid enough to volunteer and smart enough to get the paperwork done. <laughs> well, I feel the same way about Drum Circle. Uh, Drum Circle, uh, when I first started it years ago, um, was absolutely life changing for me. I went through a severe struggle with opiates. I never took anything from the street. My doctor was a pill mill and I didn't know that's what it was. Yeah. Truthfully. Just, like, I know, I know exactly what you mean, especially at the beginning of the opioid epidemic. People don't realize, like, you know, you trust your doctor. You he's don't in federal prison. Kickback now. Getting. Yeah, he's in federal prison now. 
And, uh, you know, I, I, I never took pain medicine. I really, I had just, I'd been through a lot with my bone issues in my life. And uh, so anyway, long, long story short, um, drum circle drumming was one of the things that like really kept me here. Uh, the community, um, being able to make those sounds, being able to uh, communicate with other uh, musicians, um, it, you know, with our drums and, uh, you know, a drum is so wonderful because it's it moves a, your whole body like you it, feel it go through you like, you know, there's the sound aspect. But you, it is that vibration doesn't just stop at your auditory senses. You can literally, if you get like a bunch of people moving, you feel it down in your. Oh yes, it's like it will put your hair on end. Yes. Uh, I remember, I remember because uh, I think one of the first times we actually met was, ha, huh, you were doing a drum circle at Wisteria, and this has been a few years ago. I've only been to Wisteria twice, but everybody associates me with Wisteria. I need to go back. Yes. Back well, like one of my uh, one of my friends is kidnapping me to barley corn on Saturday. If you're not doing anything Saturday, you gotta swing up. I'm cleaning to get a washer. Um, I've got a washer coming. There's things I gotta do in life. I like, know. I know. Like, it's short notice it's too. Process and that. And <laughs> yeah, it's a whole process. But I may, you know what? We may take a break and go down there. <laughs> but it's like. I don't know how far away it is from where we are. Like we may have to go through the woods to get there. Pomeroy, now. Pomeroy, Ohio. Yeah, we're in like we're in Clendenin, so we'd probably have to go to like through Spencer and back way. I don't know. It. Fun. Yeah, um, Autumn Fires is coming up later this year, but I don't really go to Autumn Fires because I get too cold. It is it is a cold. And I, I can't. You know what? For, let, well, let's get, we're getting off topic. There we are. <laughs> if you know anybody from Wisteria, tell yes. them about me. I would gladly have them on to promote Wisteria. It was a healing, magical thing. Yes. But I want to get back to the drum circle because let's, I want to talk about some of the basic things. Like if you've never, a lot of times people don't do new things because they don't know how to do new things. So what are some very basic tips for people who are interested mm -hmm. in joining a drum circle who would just like to, to show up at one and, and don't want to make an ass of themselves. First of all, we all picked up a drumstick for the first time at one time. Uh, you know, I don't particularly consider myself the best drummer in the world. I'm a good steady drummer. I'm a good bass drummer. I can keep a beat for hours, you know. Um, or box drumming, but I have friends who do this ticky tack drumming with their fingers, like on djembe and uh, tabla and stuff. And I'm just not able to do that. That's just something I can't do. I've tried. I can't do it. So, so I don't, you know, yeah, like, like, like people have a very different. Like they'll do like a light drumming, and other ones are like bam, bam. They're just like yeah. smack it. They're putting all their. <laughs> um, how is the drum surviving? Like. <laughs> well, um, uh, you know, we've all like anybody who's came to a drum circle and started drumming, you know, it, there's always a first time. I feel like drum circles are very open places where we all can really experiment and enjoy getting in rhythm with each other and enjoy getting our own rhythm that actually also goes in, but it's our rhythm. Uh, also at drum circle, you don't have to drum. You could nope, dance. Nope, because I was about to say, I was going to say, I drum for about three minutes on a borrowed drum before I get frustrated about not being able to pick up yeah. the beat. And then I start dancing. Yeah. I, I love to dance. I love to dance. Um, it's like one of my favorite things. Uh, it keeps my body moving. It's one, you know, it's a real fitness thing for me because, you know, I have some physical issues and so is drumming. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you could dance, you could sit there and meditate. Nobody's going to judge you about that. A lot of people uh, you'll see people just sitting there like with their hands on their knees yes. and their eyes shut. Just leave them be. Just leave them be. 
And then you yeah. see other people just kind of bopping, just kind of watching, observing. And then you, of course, you see my crazy ass out there dancing circles. I've been reminded a few times not to set myself on fire. <laughs> Uh, but you know, it's really, it's, it's really an open time. And so, you know, you can have a drum circle for a particular thing. Like for example, somebody passed away and you want to honor them or there's a wedding and you want to celebrate and you have a drum circle. Uh, you might have a drum circle just because we're having a community drum circle at Pagan Pride and that's what's happening. Um, you might have a private drum circle that has to do with a particular you know, where it's a causal drum circle, like, for example, say you want to give energy, like, you know, whatever people think about this is fine with me. I feel like if I concentrate and give my energy to a cause that I believe in and I get into that meditative space with that cause. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you know, think about it. that's what you think about it. A lot of um a lot of summoning rituals require a drum. You think about yes. it, it and it does start to feel like a heartbeat. You can almost feel yourself stepping into the tune of that. Like you, you feel your breathing and your body start to hit the same note at the same mm -hmm. time. Uh, yeah. Just for example, just uh, in voodoo, uh, we actually do uh, the Huntington folks. We, because uh, we have some people come and teach us. Uh, do a couple of the Loa drum beats and there are particular drum beats for particular Loa. So in order to summon Urzuli, you would do this drum beat in order to summon Papa Legba, you would do this drum beat and so on. So they're particular to that deity. That's cool. Yeah. Um, you are in, you are inviting that deity. Now um, I, I, wrote a song um well I've, I've wrote a couple songs about circles but uh one of them is an invitation song um we welcome you to the circle round blessed be and we name our ancestors we name our familiars we name our loved ones we name our friends we name people who are here we name people who are past and such uh, and it is just literally like, you know, we welcome our ancestors to our drum circle. Please visit us. Please commune with us. I do. I remember because um, we I did a I did one of the drum classes with you and we even talked about how. Especially when you're down in that metaphysical space, how you can start to reflect the spirits as well. Like I know a lot of because almost sounded like animal noises. People start making animal noises. Yes. That's actually one of our, in our drum circle leadership class, that's actually one of our exercises is to make animal noises. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, and like, you'll, you'll, you'll catch this too, that, you know, I do a lot of, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of hooting and hollering, but that's like my thing. That's how you know I'm in a circle is, you know, I, you know, I, I will then, go out there and I will do that in like the mundane world. Like if I'm at a concert or something and everybody's clapping and woo, and I'm like, and people are just like, uh, I'm the weird we, one, I guess. Okay. Us, us drum circle people, when we see each other in the store, like say I see somebody in another outlet there and I'll do it. They're like, ah, <laughs> you know, like pick up, like. Yeah, <laughs> it almost becomes like this ingrained response. Like you will respond to each other. Everybody else is like, yeah. Invading. And then like, also, oh um, I like to do the really gut deep kind of. <clears throat> oh yeah, the grunting. Like I gotta be in a <clears throat> place because it's like you know you're putting for a lot of power. Yes. Yeah, and I mean you know there might be a time I and there might be a time I. <clears throat> they're not quite the same time it depends on the feeling of the momentum here's another thing about drum circle if you come to a drum circle and you don't know what to do don't worry about it just do something just i tell something. you what there have been so many times i'm like i'm just gonna go sit and watch the drum circle and like we're about three minutes in <laughs> and you just like you get pulled into it and it's yeah. amazing, like the energy because it's like this primal it, it, it's almost like this primal community building sort of exercise, which is not at all what I brought you on the channel for. I brought you on to talk about your amazing pottery and some of your classes. And I, I like, 
Hey, Drum Circle is part is part of the things that I do out there in the world as well. Uh, absolutely, you know. Uh, absolutely. Um, also have a, a, a folk waves blog uh, on Facebook, and it's Confessions of a Root Woman on Facebook. Some of it's magical diary stuff, just about observations that I've made. Some of it's a lot of writing. Some of it's just a picture. Some of it's recipes for how to make herbal things. Um, or the benefits of doing something, or I, I did a vi my first video on that site, uh, I tapped a grapevine and I showed people how to tap a grapevine for a magical hair wash. Oh, uh, you know what y'all, you can find those links down in the description where you can like, share and subscribe. So y'all yes. remember to do that, thank you. That is really cool, like the hair washes, I love that, like I know that you had like all these really cool recipes, you did a, what, a root conjuring class for the Barefoot Gypsy not too long ago. Yes, not too long ago, yeah, and uh, classes will be picking up again in this fall, um, right now I'm doing them at Crystal Lotus and Barefoot Gypsy, so just keep on their sites and they'll be posted, or if you go to my sites, you know, if you go to Confessions of Root Room, you'll see if I'm teaching a Folkways class, because it'll be on there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as far as uh, doing clay classes, all you have to do is go to Hearth Obscura Charm Works on Facebook and hit that little messenger button and message me and say, hey, what day can I come do a clay class? And I will be happy to open up my studio and teach you anything that I can. And, you know, you don't have to make what I want to make. You get to make what you want to make in my class. So you know, if this video gets enough attention. We may have to do that video. Oh, yeah. We tell totally you that. that. Yes. Do that. I, I'll tell you, you know, I, I have done some recording of myself in the studio, but I think I texted this a couple of days ago, but sometimes that selfie stick just gets so heavy. You know, there's a lot of times that I'm working on things and I really wish somebody was videoing it because this is happening right now. I would but love to do it's more difficult for me to do that for myself. I would love to do that for you because I like, I mean, honestly, you think about it, all my videos, I'm, I'm videotaping myself, but my best work is sometimes those vlogs and things like I will get in there and get those shots like because that's that's my art. I love I, very much near magic, the eye, the perception, which is part of why my spell work comes out so strange. Um, but, you know, very much the eye kind of magic. So I, yes. I love with the camera. You know, that yes. perception magic. So if you want me to do that video, we'll set a date. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, we will. We will. I would love that. And then also, um, I had asked if I could interview you because I'd like to know all the stuff that Dottie's into. So. You know, that's kind of strange because I'm sitting here. I'm always trying to either. I'm, I'm almost promote myself as a project. Like, as I'm, it's funny because I, I would love to do an interview. But I realize that a lot of times what I do, I don't really, I, I promote one aspect or something, almost like it's a commercial, but I really don't ever just sit down and talk about all the things because I bounce between so many. Well, like, yes. I made a bunch of those, a, a bunch of those costumes. Uh -huh. I solid third are my own design and materials and you know, like you get the you see the big gay parachute just cascading beautifully uh -huh. right there. That that's my big gay parachute. <laughs> and that this blue one right here, it is it is semi cotton. It is not quite it's faux cotton, but that's a Roman outfit. It's show it showed up in some of my things. And that gray one, that is this gray outfit is for all my shadow work. Like whenever I'm doing a shadow aspect mm -hmm. of myself, I wear that one. You can see that one in the psychic constipation video. <laughs> now, <laughs> I, have, uh, watch. <laughs> I have something, something similar to that. And I've all, uh, put all, every couple weeks or something, I'll put one up. And it's like something that really happened just at that moment. And I'll, and I'll post it. And it'll say, artist occupational hazard. <laughs> and it'd be like, well, I glued myself to my project. Or... You know, whatever. <laughs> the injuries are real. The injuries are real. Like you can see where I actually, I was like, I was doing something. This is more magical than anything. But you see that little dot on the end of my finger? Uh -huh. The end of a matchstick got stuck 
on my finger while it was burning. I'm like, I looked at it. I'm like, it looks like fried sausage. Oh my goodness. Hey, I tell you what, I have a finger one like that myself. So I always, when I'm teaching uh, pit firing, I tell people, if you have a bottle, don't make the mistake that I made. Actually, I'll use this other one to show you. So don't make the mistake I made. So when you go to uh, pull, you know, pull the piece out of the fire mm -hmm. one time. And of course, it was a gloved hand. Right. I'm working with real fire and all this. But I grabbed it like this to pull it out. All of that condensed pressure and heat was inside of there. And my finger blew up like it was hard to get it off. Like it, and it like literally burned my finger completely, even though I had fire gloves on and everything. So you can imagine, but it was like that pressure and that heat built up inside of there. And of course I go sticking my finger in to pull it out. <laughs> Artist occupational hazard. Right. Okay. So we're kind of getting done. We're getting close to the end of the first half, first part of this uh, video. Of course, we're going to continue to interview and talk a little bit more personal stories uh, on Patreon, but let's go ahead and kind of round off because I don't think we're going to have a whole lot to edit out because if we do ADHD journey, I think we hit everything. We covered the magic bit, the drumming bit, the pottery bit. Is there anything else that you would like everybody else to know? And then don't forget to tell us about your, your, where um, we can find you. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, on Facebook, cause I don't have a dot com. Uh, is Hearth Obscura Charmworks on Facebook. You can see what I'm posting. You can order a custom piece. You can uh, you can uh, ask to come to a class. Um, I keep pretty regular on there. Again, I'm wearing all the hats, so I don't always I don't always have pictures of everything I'm doing. But just you know, stay with it. I'll, I'll get them all taken pictures of eventually. Well, I'm about to fix you up. I've got to come down there and fix you up. And uh, 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 for a magical blog, and it's just about uh, Appalachian folkways of all different sorts, uh, just um, an interest and pursuit of mine. I can't remember not being a granny woman. This is my past. This is who I am. I'm a granny woman. Um, and so I post some, you know, really personal stuff on there sometimes, too, but I also post uh, practical things. Uh, you know, that you can do in your life, you know, uh, as meditations or herbal mixtures for healing and such like this. Obviously, I'm not a doctor. I just play one on Facebook. But I'll tell you, you know, you can use peppermint to help you your sour stomach or whatever. OK, so. <laughs> Did you call out on me over there? <laughs> Um, and if you want to see what my whatever life is like, you can also friend me on uh, Hobgoblin Glee, which is actually spelled Hobgo Blingly. <laughs> I, yeah, I always see it as Hobgo Blingly. I, like, that was your name for me for a while. Like, yeah, I it's, it's, it's I'm like Hobgoblin Glee. And the only reason is, is because Facebook refused to believe that Meemaw Cornbread was my actual name. <laughs> I didn't really have any documents to back it up. So, you know, some hobgoblin glee, right? <laughs> but the hobgoblin is the fae of the hearth. And me being hearth obscura, of course, right? So. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah and, so. you know, I'm all, and on any of those sites. I'm posting, you know, kind of if I have an event coming up or whatever. Um, so that's, that's places you can find me currently. I don't have a .com. Um, I don't know about that. It just, if somebody else did it for me, <laughs> maybe I, just, I don't, to be honest, this is the longest time I've spent on the computer all week. Because I am not a computer person at all. <laughs> so. You know what? That's fair enough. So we can find you. We can find you on Facebook and we can find you at events. So you definitely post where you're going to be and yes. you can find her and she will definitely be. Are you going to Central West Virginia Pagan Pride in August? Um, No. <clears throat> okay. Well, yeah. then we will definitely see you at Metro Valley Pagan Pride. Oh, my yes. God. I didn't realize like I did something weird with my eyeshadow. I look derpy. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, 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 witch's ball as well uh, witch's ball 
and um, I will be posting um, when I get set up to start classes again. There'll probably be another drum circle leadership. There will definitely be uh, granny woman classes, which it, you can be a man too. I don't care. Come to class. You learn stuff. It's about herbs and stuff. It'll have, it's not, you know, I'm a granny woman. This is a granny right. way. I call it granny ways class, actually. Yeah, I don't, I don't call it granny woman granny class. Magic, you know, granny magic. Granny magic. Yeah, granny ways class is what I call it. Granny ways. You always heard it called mountain magic. magic, you know? Yes, yes. Country yes. ways. That was the old way of calling it was country ways. Country oh, ways. Country, country ways. That's country right. Country ways. Uh, and then I will probably be pulling out another uh, uh, series of folk conjure classes, which has to do with um, what I call the Appalachian hoodoo tradition. It's not the same as Memphis hoodoo. It's not the same as La New, New Orleans. It's it's particular to us and and our culture here, um, where for conjure for um, a, a specific thing in Memphis or New Orleans, you know, you might use a John and Conquer root. Well, here you might use a mandrake, which is a thorn apple. So, you know, we have some differences. It's used the same way. You're talking about sympathetic magic. And that is saying, um, I'm taking this representative object, curio, uh, you know, it could be anything. It could be a plant. It could be a piece of an animal, you know, bone or something, black cat bone, right? Uh, uh, it could be a little, I, I always like to show my little Monopoly pieces uh, oh, for conjure. Yeah, like, so I need a car, right? What do I do? I could get my Monopoly car out. It goes on my altar or I work it, work that, you know, work, yeah, work, that, yeah. work that somewhere in my hand. Um, uh, and, and, you know, just, just, just sort of things like that. You come to class, you know all about it. <laughs> I you all do it. I, I never do it at all. Yeah. Okay, I, I never, you all want to learn more because we're going to have to switch over here in just a minute. We're we're right at an hour. This has been this has been awesome. And I really want to thank you for coming on to Shameless Self Promotion. And oh, you're, oh, we could probably talk for another three hours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because this is actually, she's actually, believe it or not, I, I would consider you my friend. I hope I, you can see yes. you. Yes, we absolutely. We, talk, we chit chat about all sorts of stuff. I, I want to thank you for being so easily approachable because especially when people are first coming out into the the scene, a lot of us bigger, bigger personalities are a little harder to speak to. And I have noticed that you're like one of the first people that knew people like, even when I first came out five years ago when I first came off the mountain, uh, you were one of the first people I really remember being able to like communicate and the first person to be like, one of the first people to be like, well, come on, come down to the, the drumming circle and things like that, really engaging the community. I really appreciate that. And I'll tell you just, you know, this is humble work. Like I said, I do it for love, you know, and I, I, I do want, you know, wonderful good things and prosperity everything in my life. I want all those things. But if that wasn't a part of it, I would still do it. Yeah. It's, you it's know what I feel you there. I think yeah. I'm like so much because my YouTube channel is perpetually floundering, but I still do it any damn way. <laughs> well, I wanted to tell you, I had written a note because I, I think I told you I, I did my homework on your watching your videos and stuff. Oh, wow. And I thought this was wonderful. You said in one of your videos, Self-help for weirdos. That's my tagline. I'm telling you what. That's what this is self-help for weirdos. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. You get into magic. And I know there are some people who get, I don't know anybody who actually got into magic for the cars or anything. I mean, there are some certain people who I'm sure got into it for the flash and the flare and the excitement. But, like, that is certainly not why you stay in it. And, like, even in things that are going to teach you how to do that, like, you'll find something else as you go. You Absolutely. Get reason, and then you find yourself. If you look at every moment as a learning experience, I mean, and sometimes we got to shut down. I, I shut down sometimes. Sometimes I don't look at my Facebook. Sometimes I don't talk to anybody. You know, sometimes I shut down, and you know, and it takes me about a day to get back up on the horse again. But you know, we, we, if we, as alternative, if you will, 
uh, practitioners or, you know, belief system, if we are approachable, then maybe people won't, I mean, not that you're going to change their mind, right. but I, th I think it, I think it's good that, um, we remain approachable and we remain down to earth and that, you know, there's a little bit of sparkle, there's a little bit of pizzazz, but really when it comes down to it, this is a relationship with you and your environment and the people around you. And I think we need to be as approachable as differently believing individuals so right. that they'll quit trying to burn us at the stake all the time. I know, I know. Like I, we are, yeah. the pagan community is very aware that we're next on the docket of people to go oh, yes. after, like perpetually. Yes. I call it the unpantsing of America. So back in back in middle school, they started this thing where you know the football players, the popular boys, or whatever, run up, pull each other's pants down at the chalkboard. Right. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was a riot. I lost my mind laughing about it. I couldn't wait for the next class that somebody did it. Right. Then when I was in high school at some point, and that happened to one of the unpopular kids, and they started crying and ran out of the room, and I realized that's what this is right now. This is pick on this person, pick on this person, pick on that person. It's coming to go, it's going to come around to all of us if we don't stand up and say, hey, you don't treat people like that. That's not right, dude. I also think it is a little bit of smoke and mirrors. I think let's pick on let's pick on people who can't defend themselves and put all the blame on them for all the things we know have been wrong the whole time. Like every time I talk to somebody about their oppression experience, like I didn't realize like even pagans, like especially if you talk to like the multi-generation generational pagans, the people who had to go to normal school, having a different faith than the mainstream, their experience of oppression is different, but still very visceral to yes. every other one, to the LGBT, to the, to the BIPOC community. And there is such a massive crossover because, you know, it's one of those things that once once you've been betrayed by the mainstream, it's hard to believe anything they say. And paganism gives you a community and a belief system that is almost build your own. So you can kind of work through that and find, you know, not just people who can assist you, but the spirits that are willing to be there. You know, I, I think that we should continually be engaged in the learning experience. There are definitely things, I'm, I'll be 49 this month. Uh, there are definitely things that when I was nine, I thought differently. When I was 19, I thought differently. When I was 29, I thought differently. 39, and so on. Now, see, this is what I mean by keep talking, because we were supposed to end this 10 minutes ago almost. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Michelle, for coming on. I definitely want to see, like, we, we, we got other stuff to talk about after this. But you can keep track of her on Facebook at Hearth Obscura Charms, Charm Work. Hearth Obscura Charm Work. I got your card around here. It's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> it's a very pretty name. It is a very pretty name. That's not it. Um, so definitely check out her stuff and you can find the links below or you can find it on Madame Tortuga's Lounge on D-O-T-T-I-E, the psychic.com. Oh, <laughs> I thought I had something behind me, but I didn't. I don't know why. I was like, girl, I don't know. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and switch over to Patreon where we're going to talk a little bit more about all her nicknames. Which is a whole interesting story, and maybe a little bit more about how you came to be on this path. So yes. I hope to see you over there. Uh, if you do, you have a tagline or anything you'd like to say? Um, I have a little slogan for my business. Would you like to hear it? Yes, let's hear your slogan. Mindfully made. It's a good slogan. Safe travel and much profit to you. 
Thank you for listening to another episode of Shameless Self-Promotion right here in Madame Tortuga's Lounge, hosted by Dottie the Psychic. If you'd like to hear more of this interview and maybe help out, support the channel or whatnot, um, you can totally go to Patreon forward slash D-O-T-T-I-E the Psychic. And if you'd like to see what other craziness I'm into, check out D-O-T-T-I-E the Psychic.com. Safe travel and much profit to you.